All right, I haven't been in front of a camera in non-vlog footage in a while, so if I'm rusty, that's why. And it's a windy, stormy night, so if my camera and my microphone pick that up, just know that. Feel cozy with me. We are inside. We are warm, hopefully. I hope you are inside and warm. And we're going to talk about some books that I read in November. And I still had a pretty good reading month, even though I have been slumpy, as I've talked about in many previous videos. And slumpy not in that, like, I don't want to read. It's more that, like, I can't find things that make me want to read. It's a different conundrum, and I am sort of fighting it. Um, and if you're new to my wrap-ups, I split things into groups arbitrarily because it's fun for me because every other style of wrap-up just stresses me out. So we have a couple groups today we're going to go through. There are timestamps down below. Any videos and channels I mention will be in the description. And let's get into it, starting with my cozy mystery category. And I'm not going to be talking too much about some of these books because I just released on Wednesday an entire cozy mystery reading vlog <laughs> with so many in-depth thoughts spoiler-free on each of these books. But I read Death by Dumpling, which takes place in Cleveland, and I guess just briefly this is about a woman who works at her family's restaurant and then one of the owners of this plaza gets killed after eating their dumplings. So obviously she is a suspect and must clear her name. Um, and the attractive investigator is upset that she keeps sticking her nose where it doesn't belong because it is a cozy mystery. Um, I, I liked it. I don't think I will continue in the series mainly because when I read cozy material like this I want to be invested in the community and cast of characters and this was like good but it wasn't like great like I don't feel the need to read another story in this world even though shout out to it being from Cleveland. Uh, the next one is Assaulted Caramel. Uh, this one took place in uh, Amish country, Ohio, which I liked. And this one was the least cozy in terms of vibes and atmosphere, but it did still follow the formula like perfectly. And my favorite part about it was its community. I really liked exploring the politics and the dynamics between the characters. This is one where it's like, man, I can really explore a lot of these interpersonal relationships in future books in the series. Even though I do not like the audiobook narrator, Oh my goodness. <laughs> and I like doing cozy stuff with audiobooks. And I think this one had the most attractive investigator. And I think part of it is that he wasn't as like in her face about being like, you shouldn't be investigating things. Like I think he was just more nice about it and more charming. And this not only had cats, it had a pig. So that was great. Um, and then the other one I read is Apple Cider Slaying. And this one is my favorite. <laughs> Spoiler alert, I guess, for the vlog. Although it's pretty apparent in the vlog which one's my favorite pretty early on. Uh, this one takes place in West Virginia. There's this woman trying, her name is Winnie, trying to start her apple cider business on her grandmother's orchard to help the orchard survive, make it a full year run thing, not seasonal for financial reasons. And while she keeps trying to get this banker to see her project idea, things keep happening on the orchard, starting with a death of a neighbor, and her grandmother is implicated. And so she's trying to clear her grandmother's name. And that is where it goes. This has adorable kittens. It is Christmas on the on the eve of Christmas sort of vibes, like it starts at Black Friday. It's amazing. I love it so much. <laughs> this is one where I, I want to read more by this author. There are two more in this series. I'll probably get to them next year. So if you want more than those just like snippets of thoughts, I have a whole vlog. It has a bunch of kittens. It has my Christmas decorating things. It's got some board games. I think I did a fun way of ranking and rating them in that video because I, I rate them each on different components. Uh, so I liked putting that together. It exists. Check that out. The next one I'm putting in Closing Mystery because I truly felt like that's what this book reminded me of and that is Alatsoe. Um, I really loved this. Uh, this is a book that a lot of people say is younger YA. And I think that is because it doesn't have the traditional angst you feel in older YA. Um, there is not a lot of romantic tension. Our character is actually asexual and not pursuing a romantic relationship in this book. She has a very strong relationship with a friend and her family. She actually involves her family in discovering, not even discovering, they know who killed her cousin. They're trying to figure out how do we prove who killed her their cousin and everyone's in on it and it has this really cool urban fantasy world that is so interesting because it has a different relationship with the land like the vampires are different how magic affects the land and climate change is different and it's all in the background like it's not exposition info dumped really at least in my opinion take that with a grain of salt I do love an exposition dump and I might ignore it if it's there and not notice but I really loved the world I thought that was so captivating this is one where I wish it was a series 
because I would read so much more in this world. And not only was this a, this cozy mystery quality, and we had a ghost dog companion, we had great interpersonal relationships. There is this storytelling element where we learned about her sixth great grandmother. And I loved these like little mythological folktale stories that are interwoven. And I've heard that the next Darcy Little Badger book that I haven't read that came out last year leans more into that part of it, which has me excited for different reasons because I love being told a story. So this was great. Um, people compare it to middle grade, but I do not think so. <laughs> At least, I don't know. Like, obviously, I think if someone's like 11 or 12 and they want to read it, I don't necessarily think it's outside of their range of things they could read, maybe. I don't know. But to me, it's like this was a 17-year-old woman working with her family to solve or prove a murder. And it just didn't have romantic or interpersonal relationship angst that I think people associate with older teens. And I don't think you need to have that angst to be called a young adult book, maybe. I don't know. But th keeping that in mind, I don't read a lot of young adult and middle grades, so maybe I'm not the person who should be here. But I do know that in my video where I talked about this initially, a lot of asexual people were really annoyed that a lot of people called this middle grade in my comments because they think it kind of takes away from, like, their experiences as actual teenagers when people compare their experiences to younger people. I don't know. It's just something to think about. Regardless, it's a fantastic book and one should read it. Like, ah, oh, it was so fun. Um, so now we will get into fantasy finales, because I read two finales of two of my favorite series. Ah, oh, it was fun. And I do have videos for both of them. Um, first, The World We Make by N.K. Jemisin. I have a Should You Reads for the duology, and I loved it. It met my expectations. Do I love it as much as The City We Became? No. And I think part of that is I can feel kind of the pandemic fatigue that came into working on this one. Not only that the pandemic was happening and writing during that was probably very difficult, but also just where the United States was as a country and to have it be such a contemporary series and having to incorporate and include those things and deal with the realities of what's been happening in New York State and New York City. I could kind of feel that and it's even brought up like in the acknowledgements and interviews I saw. So I think that made it less fun for me. The city we became is a fun for me at least like it has like fish out of wow a water superhero tropes with jemison prose i have a blast with the city we became and i still love the characters i just think that because of the fatigue it's like only a 370 page book and goodness could i have read a 500 page book easily easily could have read a 500 page book i could have spent so much time with so many more of these characters i have so many favorite moments um but that said still fantastic book met my expectations i was not disappointed while reading this one. Um, and then the other one is The Lost Metal by Brandon Sanderson. I have a live show on this. I have live shows for every single book in this series if you want spoiler chats. Um, we also go pretty into Cosmere stuff in The Lost Metal, although we don't spoiler spoil plot points or any plot reveals in world building in any books in the series. But just like know that we, we took off the kid gloves and just talked about the Cosmere because The Lost Metal is really fun as a Wax and Wayne book. I had a blast. I was on the edge of my suite. I think I was so stressed reading the end of this book that I gave myself a little migraine because my heart rate was a little too elevated for a little too long because <laughs> I was just like, oh my god, what's going to happen? I was just so into the plot. So the plot itself I thought was really engaging for me. I And I thought it was so well paced how we switched between perspectives and everything like that. Like it was just, I felt like I got exactly the amount of time I needed with everyone except for Steris. I can always use more Steris. I understand why that happened the way it did, and I'm glad we at least got some Steris. But in terms of, like, Wax, Wayne, Marisi, like, other characters, like, how we bounce between our main cast, I thought was done really well. Kind of how we are attempting to solve the problem and how much time we spent on each thing, how cinematic it was. And then add to that, if you are a Cosmere fan, the Cosmere stuff is fun. It's a fun time. But there are plenty of people who didn't even notice the biggest Easter egg and still had a fun time, so it's not even essential. I had a blast. It's, it was so great. I haven't read, I think, a Sanderson book that felt so fun to me like that for the first time in a while. Like, I've reread a bunch, obviously. So although I really liked reading Rhythm of War, and I have a three-part spoiler vlog experience on the Rhythm of War when I read it in 2020, that was st still, like, a really long time. Like, you know, it's like, it's like a 1,300-page book. And this was just like, man, so much, so much happens in 500 pages. That was just such a blast. So... Yeah, that one definitely met my expectations. One of the highlights of this month, for sure. Um, I guess now pivoting, I don't know where to put this. Okay, so I'm just gonna briefly talk about um, a graphic novel I read, because I don't think it really fits into the other categories. Um, this is Earth Divers. And so this is Stephen Graham Jones graphic novel. It's the first, you know, I think the two volumes are out so far, maybe three. I heard about this from Ashley um, at the Comic Realms. 
I, they, they have two channels, Bookish Realms and Comic Realms. I'll, you know, link both of them down below. And it's about this group of indigenous people going back in time to stop Christopher Columbus. And I think that's supposed to stop the apocalypse. And I read the first issue. I'm waiting for the second one to become available at my library because um, I was intrigued and it's pretty dark and the decisions they have to make are pretty interesting. I just need more, right? Like I just, I just read like the first volume, you know, I just read, it's like 30 pages. So I don't have a lot to say, but I read it and I'm glad I did. The art was really good. And now into anthologies. Yes, these are all anthologies because yeah. And this first one, actually, I read in October and I don't know how I forgot it. It must have been because I like basically read it on October 1st and like sometimes this is Faya. Um, with magazines, you can't track them easily on Storygraph or Goodreads because someone has to input that information because they're not considered like books automatically maybe or something. I don't know. But it took a while for Storygraph to have Faya in it. So it wasn't on my, my stats when I was putting together my October wrap up. And I loved this. I think every story in this was incredibly well crafted and strong. It's like easily a four, four and a half star like anthology magazine for me, especially because it had like the horror tinges. And I think horror short stories are just a blast. And this had a lot of those horror stories that, you know, tap into generational trauma and things like that, which are topics I do like being explored at that like arm's length approach of this type of horror. The one that I remember the most vividly is this garden where people literally bury their pain in the family and how that, what, what results from that. Oh, that one was something. And I also really liked this ominous story of someone who goes to school with this person who one day disappears and maybe is a monster and like, who knows? <laughs> so that was really solid. Highly recommend. It's like a couple bucks. The next one I'll talk about is Taktumi, which is an Arctic horror story by indigenous authors and... It was good. I don't know if I disliked really any story in this collection. Like some don't stick with me as long, per usual with an anthology. But man, they were good. Like that first story is amazing. <laughs> like it's so well crafted. There was another story that focused on cannibalism that was so graphic that I was just like, wow, that was disgusting. Good job. Like, you know, it was that type of horror at times. And I, I just really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the discussions between land and people, the post apocalypse, zombies. It had a whole bunch of stuff that um, we're, I'm both familiar with and not familiar with. It had a glossary at the back of the book. I just, I had a blast with it. It's really short. It's only like 100, 178 pages or something like that. I really recommend it. Like, it. It was spooky. It was a spooky time. And then the last one I'll talk about is Terraform. I've been reading this for two months with my friends Kristen and Shannon. And this was this was great. Like, per usual, with anthologies. Is everything a hit? No, that's impossible. Especially with this anthology, I think it had over 50 stories. <laughs> um, but what is amazing about this collection is that I don't think there was any story longer than 15 pages. Um, and so that made it really great to just wake up in the morning read a short sci-fi story and discuss it with my friends. That was perfect. And all of these, even the ones I didn't like, I think there were only a handful that I thought were just actually not good short stories. They were all, whether I liked the style or not, well-crafted, paced, beginning, middle, and short story concepts, which is also, I think, really rare to have such like a consistent work, body of work like that. And, you know, I have favorites, I have least favorites. I really enjoyed the project of it. I really enjoyed how I consumed it with my friends. I think that this is a really great bite-size sci-fi that is focused on relationship between technology and humans, different potential future worlds, and also different potential futures. Um, that's like its main thing is like, what's it called? Like watch worlds burn are the three parts. And they kind of sort of collect their stories like that. And I just think it's amazing how consistent it is. I've read a lot of anthologies. And honestly, the fact that these three, all three anthologies I'm mentioning were as consistent as they were is phenomenal. That does not usually happen to me. Like, normally it's like, oh my god, this story is too long. Why is it paced like this? And then it's like, oh, that story was great. Like, it's not normally that consistent for my taste. I think part of it is the fact that they all were concise, um, which they don't need to be. I don't need all my short stories to be 15 pages, but it was just really nice to just have a collection of that in one book. Um, and then we will get into... All right, we're gonna get negative for a second and then end on a positive because I'd rather do that than end on the negative because I just, I'm gonna bring it up. This is my, it's a no for me. I do not recommend this book at all. I mean, you do you, you're presumably an adult based on my analytics, but this is Boy Snowbird by Helen Oyeyemi. And um, yeah, I uh, really didn't like this book and I'm actually gonna talk about why. Um, so if you want to know nothing about the ending of this book, feel free to go away. But this is definitely one of those things where it's like, I think you should be told what's going to happen at the end because 
Um, most readers who don't like the ending are upset about it because it's like 90% a really solid work and then it's the ending. So the ending is abrupt and tacked on. There's really no reason for it to be the way it is. I, my entire book club agreed on it. So just also know that it's not even like a thing that you could like prepare for. It's really, there's no lead up to it that is obvious really in any way. There's like one sentence. But in this story, um, Boy runs away from an abusive parental figure in New York City to live in a small town in Massachusetts. And at the end of the story, when she has a kid and a husband, her father figure comes back into her life um, for reasons unknown and then leaves again. And in this process, she learns from her friend that her father is actually her biological mother. And then the story presumes to completely dead name and misgender Frank the entire end of the book and Frank is abusive so Frank is the villain of the story and Frank became a man because of trauma in a situation that happened in his life. Um, all of these things are really harmful stereotypes that get perpetuated <laughs> and it's a very transphobic twist and I hate books that just have transphobic twist endings that a are tacked this in this case tacked on couldn't see coming this ending didn't need to be here because then at the end boy decides to take Bird and Snow her two daughters on an adventure to New York City to save Frank. <laughs> and it's 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 a mess. It's, it's it's such a messy ending. There we all discussed in the book club where the book should have ended and what it would have made sense for the themes we were even discussing in the book. Okay? Whatever was happening here with the discussion on Frank is just like it's not good. It's not good and it's harmful representation and I'm not going to say that like this was n intentionally done to be like this. I don't know. I think it was just mostly, I think it's lazy. I mostly think it's aggressively lazy, but then it's also aggressively harmful. So I don't like it. I don't like the ending. I haven't grown to like the ending because it's, 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 it fails in two of my rules. It's not story-wise good storytelling and it's aggressively harmful. Like that's my rules for getting a one star from me. It's like, you know, you can't be that way. I haven't given out a one star since like Brave New World. And so, yeah. Uh, so moving on to better things and these ones it was hard for me to think of a category because they were similar feelings so it's like a vibey category and so this is just like slow burn okay and we're just gonna call it slow burn because I also want you to understand the pacing of these works because I think that's important um, especially for one of them the marrow thieves a lot of people can read this in like a day or two so me saying it's slow paced doesn't necessarily mean it will take you a long time to read it but for me there was a pacing to it that felt slower than I anticipated because it is a dystopian and I think there is a certain pacing associated with picking up a dystopian work. Um, this, we're following a young man who is separated from his family who is surviving in Northern America during a time when indigenous folks are taken away for their blood marrow so everyone else can dream because they are the only people who can still dream. This is in a post-apocalyptic future and Basically, he comes in with another group of indigenous people and they all survive together and travel across the land to this potential location where they can be safe again. So it's kind of a traditional story type in that way. Like I've definitely, you know, seen that movie before, but the way that the narrative structure is, how we go in and out of different story times, where we hop in and out of the story, I thought was really interesting. I really loved the campfire stories. I really enjoyed watching this group of people coexist the things that worked and didn't work in their dynamics learning about this world was done I think in a really slow burn kind of way and because of the slow burn quality how we were building and building on top of things when we got to the ending I was really emotionally affected for a while I was like this is really difficult for me to read it you know it was just taking me a while to get into it not that I was disliking anything but then when I got to the ending I was just like man that was special that was a special moment um, I don't know if I'll read the sequel. I feel like I got a lot out of this. I feel like I don't know. I'd have to look into what the sequel is about and see reviews to know what is it adding to the story? Where is it taking it? Because I get nervous about dystopian sequels. Um, I don't know. I've been burned a lot by dystopian sequels <laughs> in both adult and young adult. It's not just one. It's like dystopian sequels are hard because a lot of the intrigue of a dystopian, in my opinion, is the world building. Um, but that said, the character dynamics, I thought, were pretty compelling in this. Um, it doesn't really have a gimmick, per se. It's it's mostly about survival, and I love survival stories, which is also probably why I really enjoyed this. And some survival stories can just be intrinsically slow burn, because some of it is just day-to-day -day stuff, which I eat up. So I really liked this. And the other one is the last book I read for the month, and... <laughs> I, th I loved this way more than I did, although I need to read the second book because I feel like it's an incomplete thought in my head right now. Like, I understand why it, 
I think I understand why it ended where it ended, and I still need to make a spoiler video for my patrons about it, because this was our patron buddy read, and that's semiosis. So, semiosis is fascinating, <laughs> okay? This is like, if you like sci-fi for, like, I don't know. This feels like sci-fi, okay? I don't know how else to say this. Like, when you are growing up and you think about what is science fiction, maybe you haven't really watched it or read it, and you're like, what is it? It's like, it's this. This is sci-fi. <laughs> Does that make sense? I don't know if that makes sense. But basically, we have the humans on this planet. They are traveling to another planet because Earth is messed up, and they're going to start a new life. They're going to start over. They're going to this planet. They're going to name it peace. They're going to embody that idea. And they can technically live on this planet, but it's really hard, and the wildlife and biology is unlike anything anything they could expect. And so it's basically like, so we've all seen that movie of, you know, generation ships going to a planet and then, you know, alien happens or something like that. And this is like, well, what if alien doesn't happen? It's still really hard. It's still really stressful. And like, there's still a lot of tension and mystery and like, ah, I'm stressed the entire time. But what if you actually are given a couple generations to actually let this problem play itself out? Um, and that's what you get to do in symbiosis. And on top of getting this, these generational jumps, which the first half of the book, quite large generational jumps. Like you jump generation to generation for like three or four generations, but then you kind of get to be chronologically in the flow of the story. But not only do you have that, which I love. So generational sci-fi, which is like Asimov, right? That's classic. Um, we are fleeing Earth to go to another planet to form a new colony. That's classic sci-fi, right? Um, we've got a really weird plant situation. Like, and it is fascinating. Oh my goodness. And like the thematic commentary is so good. And each chapter is a different character. And I thought each character really had its own voice. Like, I thought that was so well crafted. Like, there's just so much I appreciated and enjoyed about this, even though it did take me a really long time to read 330 pages of it. Now, is it because I'm slumpy? Who knows? But I didn't mind it. I just like read it and I just read it when I wanted to read it and I was just like I really like these sentences and I really like this character work like it it worked for me I'm still processing the ending I'm still doing that but I finished it <laughs> so that's this wrap up I think that's everything that I have read and it was pretty good like I said got got some stuff done and I'm going to try and continue the good vibes read when I want to read try and read what I want to read that makes me want to read and I have some plans for that some interesting things I've signed myself up for <laughs> Which is probably counterproductive to the whole, like, mood reading thing, but I'm excited. Um, let me know what were your hits of November, um, and if you want to leave an emoji, leave a vine? Do they have vines? Leave a plant emoji. I would love a plant emoji. And otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!